to uh, ask for this. Uh, I didn't realize that I was going to have so much of my family here tonight, and uh, you, of course you always are concerned about when your family comes when you're speaking. It's like my children, I always have told them, I said, whenever, uh, if our house catches on fire, the first thing I want you to do is to be sure that you save all of my sermons. And they looked at me and they said, why? Uh, and uh, that's the way it is, you know, when family come to hear you speak, you know, they've heard all of the stories and all that kind of thing that you do. As a matter of fact, my wife <clears throat> wanted so much to come with me, she was just begging at lunch. I would not ask her to come. I figured she'd made her own decision, and I knew if I'd asked her to come, what she would say, so I didn't bother to ask her. So uh, at lunch, she said, would you like me to go with you? I said, well, I'd like you to go with me if you want to, and she was just begging. The reason I think she wanted to come, she'd rather, rather come with me than kiss me goodbye, but, you know, uh, I was hoping that, you know, you could get to meet her because uh, uh, she has lived through a lot, uh, as Terry indicated, uh, through the change uh, that's come. You know, I've I worked with a lot of Elvis impersonators before, but this is the first one I've ever worked with that looked like Jimmy Swagger. <laughs> I was expecting somebody to be in a white suit and scarf around the neck, and, uh, and we almost got to it, though, Lynn. We almost got to it. Uh, I have to say that uh, you know, you know that whenever you do a presentation like this, that uh, some of the things that you say might not be exactly true. Uh, we had a saying when I came up, you know, it was coming up. My mother didn't. And I say this in memory and honor of my mother. Because, you know, we always would say, you know, somebody's telling the story, that meant a lie. And I want you to know that most of uh, what I'm going to say tonight is the truth. And uh, one of the things that my wife told me before I left, she, you know, she treats me like a god. That's a lie. Uh, but, uh, you know, some of the things that I say may not be exactly true, but I, I have fallen... Uh, in appreciation for a book years ago that's impacted my life called Acres of Diamonds. If you've not read it, it's a wonderful story that I'll not go and tell you the whole story, but in essence it says that, you know, a man sells his farm, he goes in search of the diamonds across the world and comes back and discovers that, uh, you know, the diamonds that he was looking for after he ended his life, someone discovered that on the farm that he had sold were the acres of diamonds that he was looking for. And I've found that, you know, through life, that most of what we're looking for is in our own backyard, right near us, right where we are. And I want to encourage you to always, as a family, look at the humor in your family, the stories in your family, and I hope that you'll rehearse those stories, tell those stories, and uh, because to me it's one of the most, and one of the greatest treasures that we have. Fred Craddock said of humor that humor is the incongruent, the things that just don't fit together. Like, a, you know, uh, I heard a guy get up one day and he looked out over the congregation and he looked at the people and he said, I see some faces out there I'd like to shake hands with. Well, you know, you, know, you don't shake hands with faces. And it was sort of like a youth minister who got up in our church one day and as youth ministers often do, he got up and said, now I want to tell you something that's true before I preach. Uh, you know, and it just doesn't fit. Uh, and uh, I remember a night when I was away on uh, one, one Sunday evening, uh, we had a bomb threat to come in to the church. Literally, we had a bomb threat to come in, and the youth minister was preaching. And uh, Odie Gressick got up, and he carried a note up to him. He was the chairman of the ushers. He carried a note up to Bill and said, Bill, uh, we've had a bomb threat come in. And he looked at the note, read the note, told the congregation what, ha what, what, it, what, what was happening. He said, you know, he said, I think we'll have a prayer, and then we'll go outside. His wife, who was his redeeming quality, looked, spoke up and she said, let's go outside and then have the prayer. Uh, which makes a whole lot more sense, you know, when you think about it. And I was trying to express this the other day, things that just don't fit. I was telling my congregation, you know, about, you know, not being able to see clearly and to think clearly. And I said, you know, I got cataracts on my brain. Uh, well, that just doesn't fit cataracts on your eyes. But, you know, old people get those things mixed up. Uh, medical terms among old people, are, you know, it's just amazing. And I work with a, a, an older congregation, and uh, some of the things that they say, like one woman who had kept telling me about having hemorrhoids taken off of her eyes, you know, and, I, and one guy kept talking about it, you know, his wife was having an autopsy on her lips. Uh, people just get some things, you know, confused. Now, 
I'm what you call a Facebook stalker. Uh, some of you may be on Facebook. I'm a Facebook stalker. I don't write much on, but I like to read what other people are saying. And it's just amazing to me how funny there are, how funny people are. One woman was put on her Facebook, literally a woman I used to work with. She said, uh, could some of you let me know, I said, I'd like to trade my teenagers for whatever is behind door number two. And I think every one of us, you know, come to that point in life. And I, I uh, remember my, my children, they were, said something about a pig pen one day. They said, what's a pig pen? And I said, well, just imagine your room without a stereo. And that's a pretty good description of what a pig pen really is. Uh, so, you know, you have to appreciate it. One, one woman wrote on her Facebook the other day, she said, uh, the only man that has all of his problems behind him is a school bus driver. And I think that's a good idea. But, uh, you know, there are all kinds of things that surprise us. My wife literally surprised me last night. We uh, have a man in our church who's always coming to the church and just telling me stories and jokes and whatever, and he wants me to use them and, and everything. And the other, recently he kept telling me about this, uh, said he told his wife, Joyce, that I'm, I've got you uh, something very shiny. And that thing will, as a gift I'm going to give you, it'll go from zero to 150 in two seconds. And I, I couldn't figure out, and he finally, you know, kept telling me, he said, well, what it, what it is, it's a, it's, a, it's a new scales. You know, and he wanted me to tell that on my wife, you know, I wouldn't do it. I, I said, of course, I said, I told her, I did tell her this, and I just sort of get a curiosity up. I said, I've got something I want to get you that's real shiny, it's new. It'll go from zero to 110 in two seconds. And he called me a chicken. Well, last night, uh, after uh, uh, we were sitting at the table, she came in, and literally, she came in with a bag, and she said, I had to hurriedly get you something together. And I had not told her this story because I was just building the curiosity. You know how a woman's curiosity is. It is a love to play with a curiosity. And so she came in, and she had a, had a bag with a pair of scales in it because this guy... I uh, had told her what the story is all about, and I, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, I sort of uh, called him up and had a few words with him. But I'm going to tell you, marriage and family is a wonderful thing. Uh, for, I have a wonderful wife. We've had 39 wonderful years together, and that's not bad out of 43. Uh, and we've had a wonderful life together, and uh, I, I, was, I was reminded... Uh, about long marriage. You know, have y'all seen that? I think it's a state farm, all state commercial, where the woman comes down and the man is down and, you know, talking to his insurance agent on the phone. Yeah. And she comes down and she says, Who is that you're talking to? She takes the phone, grabs it out of his hand, and she says, Rosemary, what are you wearing? Khakis. She said, She's wearing khakis. He said, No, it's not a she, it's a he. Well, you know, it's easy for us to jump to the wrong conclusions. I read about a man who, man who came home, a woman who came home, and she went right to the bedroom, and there she saw something in the bed that she wasn't expected. Two, two figures in the bed, and she, you know, took a ball bat, and she just whack, 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 came back down to get her a drink of water, and looked over there was her husband, and she said, "What in the world are you doing?" She said, "Well, I, I hope you don't mind, but your mommy and dad came to spend the night with us, and I hope you told them hello." <laughs> You know, you can drop wrong conclusions. Uh, uh, it's very easy, to, you know, to do that. Uh, another friend of mine put something on his Facebook this past. Oh, yes, yeah, he was there today. He said, and this was from Socrates, he said, By all means, marry. If you, get a wife, if you get a good wife, you'll be happy. If you get a bad one, you'll be a philosopher. And beneath that, and I know this couple, I work with them, she put under an, and which one of you and had an H with a, about a dozen M's after it, wondering, you know, uh, which one are you? He dared not use the, the, the phrase that I heard about marriage when I first started out. Somebody said, you know, marriage is like hot water. You put your, once you put your foot in it, uh, you know, it's not so hot. Uh, but I dare not use that one. Uh, if you know my family, we, we came from a, a mildly just mildly dysfunctional family and as a matter of fact I raised a mildly dysfunctional family and I'm a little slow myself it takes me an hour and a half just to watch 60 minutes but uh, uh, sometimes you know that could be embarrassing to your family and I told my children I said whenever I stop started embarrassing you uh, from the pulpit then I'm gonna quit preaching 
Then I reflected on that and I thought, my word, Terry, I would have never started if that was the case. Uh, you know, many times, you know, ministers have to move and uh, I always get in the way whenever we're moving. And so uh, we made a move and my family, you know, go on, go on to the office, do what you got to do, whatever preachers do, go on to the office and do it. And uh, when we get everything set up, we'll, you know, come get you, tell you come on over. So I went and got busy doing all the things, you know, that preachers do that you think we don't do. And I was uh, busy out throughout the day and, believe it or not, got ready to go to the new place. I couldn't remember where we moved to. I couldn't remember the address. And so, so I figured, well, if I just go back into the neighborhood that we had lived in, that maybe I could uh, remember the address. Um, Bill Cosby says that if you can't remember anything, there's a connection between your head and where you sit. And if you just go back and sit down, you rem remember. So I thought maybe I'd use that philosophy. I go over there and I would uh, remember where we lived. And so I came into the neighborhood and there was uh, our, our house was there and our basketball still there. There was a kid out there playing basketball. And, uh, you know, I rolled my window down. I said, you remember that family that used to live there? And the little boy said, yes. I said, uh, do you know where they moved? He, he said, yes. Then he said, come on, Daddy. Mama said you'd forget where we moved. <laughs> I tell you, my wife's very frugal. Uh, she's very frugal. Uh, she won't let anybody fool her. She uh, had a salesman to come in and sold us some windows. And, uh, and so a year later, uh, the contractor that put them in called uh, her up and was really putting her task over the fact that she had not paid for those windows. She said, let me tell you something. I may be old. And she said, I may have been a blonde, but you can't fool me. Your salesman told me that if I'd buy these windows, that within a year they'd pay for themselves. <laughs> Terry, you'd be interested to in, know uh, I'm frugal too. I went to the dentist one day and I walked into his office and I told the dentist, I said, I want you to know that I want to got a tooth I want you to take out. I don't want any of that Novocaine. I don't want it to be put to sleep. I don't want any of that stuff that you, you know, you do to, to deaden it or anything. I just don't want to do it. He said, man, said, I have never had a man to come in here that was so courageous and so brave. He said, uh, uh, well, we'll take care of it. So I looked at my wife and said, honey, show him which tooth you want to take a nap. <laughs> You know, being a grandparent is one of the greatest joys, and uh, if you're not a grandparent, uh, it's one of the greatest joys in life. And uh, my grandchildren call me Pappy, and they call my wife Grandma. And our we got one girl out of six, uh, all boys, five boys and one girl. And she, of course, is a princess. She's the oldest. But when she was very small, a little, uh, she'd come to the house, and uh, you know, and I just delighted in taking care of her. And so she was left in my charge one day. And we were just having a good time. She had gotten a new tea set. And uh, she would uh, bring me some tea, you know, and I'd be sitting in my easy chair, ignoring her except for the time when she'd come up and bring me something. So I'd take it and I'd drink it. And I'd say, oh, how good, wonderful, wonderful. Now that was the cutest thing in the world. So when Granny got back home, uh, I said, you got to stand right here. I want you to see this. This is just the sweetest thing you have ever seen. And so I said, Kaylin, bring me some, uh, uh, some tea. So she went down to the hall, came back with a little teacup full. She brought it up there, and, uh, and I told her, mm, that's so good, that's so good. And uh, my wife uh, looked at me after she uh, left the room. She said, did it ever occur to you that the only place that she can reach water is in the toilet? <laughs> We've always had uh, a lot of fun on vacations. My, uh, we, 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 had a, we had what we called a motor home. My son had said his only motor home we ever saw was a dirt floor. Uh, but, you know, we had a lot of fun doing that. And as a matter of fact, our children were uh, uh, make, going to make a trip. And they said, I'm sure that you all had the same expectations, you know, as we had. But, uh, and we did. But my wife had a, has a wonderful way she, of keeping our children uh, quiet when I was preaching when they were very small. That she'd always tell them, said, now, if you interrupt your daddy and he gets disoriented, he's going to have to start all over again. <laughs> and, uh, I kept them pretty, pretty much uh, you know, in line. But I have to say to you, you know, that uh, I, I, you know, we deal with world problems, but I'm convinced that the world's problems all started with zip codes. Did, did we have all these problems that we got now before zip codes? 
I can remember Terrius 2, TE2, 22J. That was our party line. And, and, and I can't imagine, you know, uh, all these problems are because of these uh, zip codes that have uh, been added. You know, they've got zip codes and added zip codes. And uh, we grew up in a, uh, eight of us. My mother gave birth to eight children. Six of us survived, barely. We lived in, uh, I used to tell everybody we lived in a house that was 792 square feet. My daddy heard me one day and he said, son, you know, uh, I hate to get you a brag. He said, you know that house was 772 square feet? And I was telling everybody one day, I said, you know, we, we could see the chickens uh, through the cracks in the floor. My daddy stopped me again. He said, son, you know we didn't have any chickens. Uh, so, you know, we you, were sort of kept in line uh, c coming from that kind of house, that kind of home. But uh, uh, zip codes are, are, have been a real problem. But I want you to know that uh, one of the greatest delights in my life has been serving a, an older congregation. Uh, I serve at East Point First Baptist Church. It's a transitional community. Inner city, you might say. All of our folks are, are old. My wife's 64. She sings in our youth choir. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's an old group. I had a man one day to take me out. We up that close to the airport. He took me out one day. And he said, you sniff the air. And he said, you smell that jet fuel? fuel? I said, yeah. He says, that's a preservative. And I tell you, we got folks that, you know, are that old. It is a preservative. Matter of fact, we had a man to die one day in our, one of our services. And the EMTs came, rushed in there, and went to the, had to go to the fifth one before they found the one that was dead. <laughs> I had a lady, I mean, this, this lady fell at the restaurant uh, one day. She, she, she fell on the floor and she was, I thought she was gone. And I think she just looked at her bill and, you know, she got, and so I rushed over there to help her. And uh, I was about ready to do CPR and I said something about it. But it's amazing when she heard me say I was going to do CPR, how quickly she got over her illness. One of my favorite songs at my church is, Put the Hers in Reverse, I Want to Live Again. Uh, it's just absolutely the thing that we live for. I have one woman who, this same woman that fell out at the restaurant, her daughter lives in Mexico, Penny, and she comes to church and visits with us at church, and uh, her mom, you know, can't remember and forgets things, and she walks around, and whenever uh, she begins to tell her a story that she's heard before, she'll hold up a finger one time, maybe, and then she's heard it three times. And uh, just to let her know, you know, I've heard this story. It's interesting about old folks. You know, they don't ever forget their stories, but they forget who they told them to. Uh, and so she, this is the method that they've worked out. But the unfortunate thing is that whenever she comes to church, when I start preaching, I look at it and she goes, you know. And I know, you know, she's heard this one before. Uh, you know, you, as a pastor, you run into all kind of counseling situations. I, I, I married a couple... Oh, several years ago, he was 89, she was 90. This was his third wife, and as a matter of fact, he was married to this woman's first wife. And, uh, and I baptized him at uh, almost 90 years of age. So I run into a lot of that, but some Sundays, you know, people catch you by surprise. We had a couple one day that came in just before the service, and uh, I, I, I have some hearing deficiency and uh, have a lot of memory deficiency, and I didn't catch their names. And so at the end of the service, I thought it was a good idea for the congregation to stay, you know, and watch, you know, be a witness to the marriage. And so I asked them just to be seated, and I said to, to the, I said, uh, since I couldn't remember his name, I said, those of you who'd like to get married, would you come on down to the front? That poor old fellow on his walker came down, and there were nine women following him down to the front of the church. <laughs> I finally got it all sorted out. I got it all sorted out as to who was going to get married, and uh, got him back before me. And of course, after the you know after I'd done the service, uh, uh, he looked at me and you know like most of these people do, they said, "Well, how much are you, preacher?" And you know, Joe, we've always tried to be very humble about that. And I said, "Well, you know, just pay me what you think she's worth." And uh, so you know, he reached in his pocket and he gave me a dollar. Well. When he lifted her veil, I gave him 75 cents in change. <laughs> and some of our old folks, folks uh, you know, tell me all kinds of their uh, love life and things. One woman came one Sunday and she said, I like to pick out hymns in the service. And she looked over and she said, I like him and him and him. And then she said, you know, I was out the other day and I was looking at a man and I looked at him and I smiled at him and I said, and he looked back to me and he smiled back to me and he said, why, why are you smiling to me? She said, well, I said, you look like my third husband. <laughs>
He said, well, how many times have you been married? She said, two. <laughs> you know, doctors can be real cruel to seniors. Uh, if you've been around seniors, they, have, they spend a lot of time in a doctor's office. And so this woman came back the other day was telling me that uh, her doctor was very, very cruel. He said, I got some bad news for you. And he looked at her and said, you're dying. And she said, Doc, dying? How long have I got? The doctor says, ten. She said, ten what? He said, nine, eight, <laughs> seven. My wife is always encouraging me to do things. She, she holds other people up to me. And she looked out the other day and she, one of our neighbors was talking about how he always, you know, was so uh, uh, kind and everything to his wife. And she said, look at him. Said every time he greets her, he, he, uh, he kisses her. Said, and she looked at me and said, why don't you do that? I said, well, honey, I'd like to, but I don't know her that well. <laughs> we, had, we have some new businesses that uh, started in East Point. Uh, one recently started up, started up and, and the guys had not, they, they had the building opened up, but they didn't have, uh, didn't have any of their stock in. And, they, they, you know, they were sitting around, and they knew it was a mainly a senior adult community, and they said, oh, good gracious. They said, there ain't no, there ain't no time for some of these seniors are going to be coming in and bothering us. And sure enough, a few minutes there was a, uh, a senior adult came up, knocked on the window, and he said, um, what y'all selling in here? And you know how young people are, they want to be smart. And uh, they said, well, we're selling morons. And the guy said, well, you must be doing pretty good. You only got two left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I heard a screeching hawk in in, out in the church lot one Sunday. Uh, and I uh, saw this young man, he, you know, came bouncing in and uh, he was throwing his keys up and he said, you know, that's what you can do when you're young and quick. And I said, what's going on? And he said, well, I said, um, uh, I was trying to get a parking place and there was only one parking place and this old woman was trying to get it. So I quickly went in in front of her and so he was walking. Well, that's what you can do when you, you're young and quick. All of a sudden, there was this boom, boom, blam, blam. He looked back and this old woman's car was sitting right up on top of his. And she got out and she says, that's what you can do when you're old and rich. So you gotta be careful uh, about, uh, about these old folks. Well, one of the wonderful things about being old and working with older congregation is the fact that we, you know, it's easy for us, we can hide our own Easter eggs and get away with it and have fun with it. Uh, but, uh, I, uh, I met one of the, an interesting man this past Saturday was a week ago, Richard Henry Green. Richard Henry Green is 85. He's in the Golden Crest uh, Nursing Facility in Mara, Georgia. A friend of mine asked me to go over and uh, interview him and talk with him, you know, and so I did. And he wrote a song that he wanted to put somewhere where his friends could hear the song. And he wrote a song and sang the song. It's called Sweet Rose Mary. And uh, in my interview with him, I said, uh, uh, Mr. Green, I said, how did you come by writing this song? Without hesitation, he said, my wife's disposition was sweet. Rose is the most beautiful flower. And Mary from the Bible, how could you have any better combination? And as we think of life, I think each of us can, uh, you know, can identify with that. And I want to close with this uh, one little story. And I, I don't know, last time I saw Danny Phillips uh, out in public, he was over at Harold's Barbecue, uh, and uh, it may be that Danny was responsible for this, but this old fella got him a brand new Mercedes, and uh, he was trying it out. And he was on one of Georgia roads, and he was just driving as fast as he could, and he met this state patrolman who uh, turned around and took off after him. And uh, the state patrolman, you know, was end of the day, and he, you know, this guy was just, he said, oh, I can outrun him. And so he got up to 70, 80, got up to 100 miles. He said, I'm too old for doing this, so he should stop. Patrolman got out, and he came around to him, and he said, now, you know, it's near the end of my day. He says, if you can give me uh, an excuse I have never heard before, if you can give me an excuse I've never heard before, said, I'm going to let you go. Well, the man said, you know, said, I've been, uh, uh, the state patrolman several years ago ran off with my wife and when I saw you coming I thought you were bringing her back <laughs> and the patrolman looked at him and said have a nice evening 
and I want to say to you, have a nice evening. <laughs>